It's Platt, and today we head to the Rockies. That's next to Platt's Beer of the Week. So the uh, particular beer we have today is Coors Banquet Beer, Coors Original, the, the true original beer from Coors Brewing. Um, real quick, just kind of looking through the different videos I've done through this beer series, I've never really touched on the Coors portfolio of beers. So I thought uh, this would be a great way. Uh, Coors, the banquet beer, is one of the classic brands out there. Again, it's a good example of what I was talking about. Some of these brands that 30, 40 years ago were bigger than they are now. These kind of got forgotten, but as far as the importance it's played in uh, the history of American beer, Coors Banquet Beer is, again, one of those uh, big brands. A little history on Coors. Coors was founded by Adolph Coors and Jacob Schuler in 1873 in Golden, Colorado. The company is still based in Golden, Colorado today. Uh, Adolph originally only invested $2,000 in the company while Jacob came in with $18,000, so he was by far the bigger uh, investor at the time. However, it was a few years later in 1880 that Adolph ended up buying out uh, Jacob out of the brewery, and I'm sure Jacob's family has regretted that ever since. Um, just like every other brewery in America, uh, Prohibition hit Coors hard, but Coors was in a little better situation, actually came out of Prohibition better than most breweries, and there's a couple reasons why. Uh, first, Colorado entered Prohibition a few years earlier than the rest of the states. Uh, Colorado entered it in 1916, while the, most of the U.S. it was 1920. Also, even before 1916, though, Coors had already gotten into some other businesses, and that's really helped, helped him get through Prohibition. Uh, they sold porcelain, that was one of their bigger businesses, uh, cement, they even got into the real estate business. Uh, one of the businesses that really carried them through uh, Prohibition was malted milk. They produced malted milk, and a majority of the malted milk they produced ended up going to the Mars Candy Company. So imagine getting that contract with Mars Candy during Prohibition. That was probably a pretty big deal and probably what really helped them get through that era. Also, like a lot of breweries at the time, they produced a non-alcoholic or what was referred to as near beer back then. Uh, their brand was called Mana, and actually that recipe was kind of the base and, and very similar to what they produce today as far as non-alcoholic. I believe it's Coors Cutter is the non-alcoholic beer. Uh, oddly enough, I don't drink a lot of non-alcoholic beer. But anyway, uh, the recipes are, are similar, and so uh, that Coors Cutter has its roots, uh, you know, 100 years old, which is kind of a, a cool little story. Now, even after Prohibition, Coors kept these companies for a long time. Um, it wasn't until the late 80s, early 90s that they divested themselves from these companies. I guess at that point, they finally realized, all right, maybe we're not going to try this silly Prohibition thing again. We can, you know, let these uh, companies go. Now... What made Coors kind of the cult beer it became and really uh, one of the most sought after beers was that for a long time, a huge part of its history, it, wasn't, it was only distributed in 11 states out west, uh, the two biggest being California and Texas. Texas was the farthest east you could find Coors for a long time. Uh, they didn't even get into Montana and Washington until 1976. So, I mean, well after Prohibition, this wasn't necessarily even a Prohibition thing. They just did not distribute widely. This led to, uh, again, more people kind of wanting it, especially back east. Um, a good example today is Yingling. You, you, you haven't been able to get Yingling everywhere. I know out here in Vegas, I think it's finally coming out here. It was distributed out here years ago, then it quit. And I know I've had people at, bar, you know, at my bar ask me all the time for Yingling. Well... Imagine that times 10. That was Coors back then. So much to the point that they ended up making a movie about it. Smokey and the Bandit. If you're old enough to remember that movie, the main theme was that Big Enos and Little Enos wanted some Coors beer to celebrate, uh, I believe, a truck race victory or something like that. And they paid the Bandit big money to run to Texarkana, Texas, and bring them back some Coors to Atlanta. Um, luckily, by the late 80s, They'd gotten national distribution, and so no one had to bootleg anymore to get Coors uh, beer. Uh, the company did eventually end up merging with Molson in 2005 to form Molson Coors. 
Uh, they are the third largest producer of beer here in the U.S., even though it's kind of a funny uh, structure because there's also Miller Coors due to, uh, due to antitrust laws or whatever, so it's a little different, but uh, Molson Coors is one of the largest beer conglomerates worldwide as far as their uh, portfolio of beers. Uh, one thing about uh, Coors is that the uh, production facility at Golden is uh, the largest brewing facility in the world. Unlike Miller and Anheuser-Busch, Budweiser, they have regional beers. They produce those beers across the country. If you're drinking a Coors product, it's made in Golden. So they need to obviously, even though sales-wise are comparable to those other two, they obviously need a larger facility. Well, enough of before we try this Coors beer, let's check out the stats. So today I thought I'd go over a little bit about the Coors portfolio of beers. Like I said, I really haven't touched Coors products throughout this video series. I'm kind of mildly surprised by that just because, again, they're, they're part of Molson Coors. There's a big portfolio of the brands. And uh, so you think I'd randomly grab one, but it, like I said, I haven't touched on it. So I thought we'd talk about some of their beers today. Uh, first and foremost is Coors Light. Um, it was their entree into the light beer market. Uh, Coors Light came out in 1978, actually about four to five years before uh, Bud Light came out. So they were a little, an earlier adopter of the light beer. Uh, of course, Coors Light is also known as the Silver Bullet due to the silver can. We had kind of a golden can for Coors Banquet, so they went with a silver can uh, for Coors Light. Uh, I believe a while back, a few years ago, it actually was the highest selling beer in the U.S. I don't know if it's still that way today, but I do remember one time. I think it was. I think it took over Budweiser's spot at one time. You know, Budweiser forever and ever was the biggest selling beer in the U.S. Uh, those days are gone, though. Uh, next is Keystone. Keystone, or the Keystone line of beers, was first introduced in 1989, about the time I was starting to drink. And the big selling point for Keystone was bottled beer taste in a can. Now. Uh, a few years later, they introduced bottles of Keystone, which kind of confused all us drunk college kids, but we didn't care because it was cheap. And that was the purpose of the line. Um, Anheuser-Busch had the Budweiser line of beers, but then their value line was Bush. For Miller, it was the old Milwaukee line. So Coors wanted their own value line, and that's when they came out with uh, Keystone. And there's Keystone, Keystone Light, Keystone Ice. I think they've even gotten to the hard seltzer thing now. But that's their, you know, value line of beers. Next is an interesting beer because I, it, it's not a, a, a different style, but it's kind of a variation on it. And I, I've always kind of liked these beers. Extra Gold Lager. It uh, basically was similar to Coors Original. It's still an adjunct, you know, typical American adjunct lager, but it was slightly fuller bodied, slightly darker golden color to it. Just, it was a little more. I guess a good example would be Michelob. Now today when we think Michelob, we think Michelob Ultra, but for a long time, Michelob was kind of considered a premium beer. Um, you know, you had your Bud, Miller, Coors, and Michelob was just, a half notch above it won it won import beers uh, but probably price wise it probably had been priced similar to a Heineken or Corona an import more than it would have been priced like Bud Miller Coors you probably at the liquor store probably had to spend an extra buck a 12 pack for it and extra gold was kind of Coors's answer to that style of beer again we're not talking about a totally different type just I guess a different interpretation of that style something just slightly more refined and I, I emphasize slightly but it, it was uh like i said just it just seems slightly more sophisticated I, I guess last but not least is killian's red um we actually briefly touched on red beers when i was talking about ice beers the other day and somebody put in the comment section that killian's was probably the first real red beer in the u.s and that they're probably right on that uh, the recipe for this beer actually dates back to 1864, and it had been produced in Ireland for years and years and years. But by the late 70s, 
early 80s, uh, the folks that were brewing in Ireland decided they wanted to grow the brand more and they wanted that beer to be shared with the world. So they end up licensing the brewing of Killian's to Coors in 1981. And that was before Coors had really become a national brand. They hadn't gained national distribution yet. So it's kind of a unique uh, thing to do. I remember being first introduced to Killian's Red. And this is before, you know, there had been the 80s craft beer movement, but that would only have hit in certain pockets of the country. In Dallas, where I was living at the time, uh, Killian's was kind of considered craft. It was, again, different than the Bud Miller Coors or the Keystones that I was drinking in college. So even though we kind of look at it now as just another big beer brand, at the time it really was kind of something unique. Well, enough about Coors products. Let's try a Coors product. All right, plenty of bubbles, nice clear beer, head of white, or about one, one finger of foamy white head. Uh, no hops on the nose, pretty straightforward type beer. Let's give her a try. Tastes like America. Uh, tastes like I need to be sitting on the back of a pickup truck. Uh, pretty standard um, you know, American adjunct lager, uh, plenty of sweetness up front. Um, body fairly light. Um, well, fairly light if you're a craft beer drinker. If you drink Michelob Ultra, this almost seems like a big beer. <laughs> you know, uh, definitely more bodied, more malt to it. Uh, Goes down easy. Uh, there's no hop bitterness in this. Um, like I said, sweet up front, but not clawingly so. Pretty straightforward beer. This is a, a you know what I call a consumption beer. Um, this is a beer that you'd do out of a beer bong, or you'd chug, or you'd have a picture of, or what have you. But. Um, That being said, though, this is also a really good summertime beer, out at the lake beer, you know, food, going fishing beer. Um, I can't really nail why it would be different than Miller High Life or, or Budweiser per se. Um, but it's just, it's just a nice, easy drinking beer which is kind of what all these are designed to be at the end of the day when they're not trying to reinvent everything. It, it's not going to win any awards, but just a nice, easy drinker on a warm summer day. Well, I hope you liked this video. If you did, please subscribe down below. Also, please like the video because it lets YouTube know we're putting out good content. If you have any questions, comments, concerns, or beers that you'd like me to try, please leave them in the comment section, or you can always contact me on the Twitter page. Till next time, bottoms up.